Great. We are recording. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, definitely. Everybody on the call, if you want to attend a fun evening tomorrow with our Mappy Hour with uh, Tim and uh, who was all on, on, on that one, Ollie? Uh, Liz Parrish and Tim Allen. Tim Allen. It, it's fantastic. Uh, y'all should check us out. So go to the website and, and check that one out for sure. But well, today I want to welcome you all to the May uh, 2021 Eurasia Texas Speaker Series. So uh, we've got a really great uh, presentation today. It's a map design for the everyday map. Um, uh, Ollie and John and I got together to uh, kind of brainstorm on a presentation. And so uh, this is kind of what we came up with when we hope you all like it. Uh, uh, John uh, Nelson is uh, an employee of uh, Esri, ASRI, and he just pretty much does everything maps. Uh, enjoys it, loves it, it's a great presenter. And I'm just going to go ahead and turn this over to John so he can uh, um, take it away and present to you today. So appreciate it, John. And here you go. Thank you all for attending. Yeah, thank you, Brian and Ollie. Brian and Ollie, don't let me get away with rehashing old crap got to be new content so this is all all a new new concept um and also i'm the only person with their video on right now is brian king so brian that's a lot of pressure on you to give me all the energy i can possibly yes thank you jesus so if you feel like turning your video on it's okay with me if it's okay with with you all brian and, and ollie gives me um oh yeah gives me the sense that i'm actually talking to other humans this time <laughs> You know, what a year, what a year it's been. And it's great to see all your faces. I love it. And thank you so much for showing up. It's an honor. Um, also, it's a lot of fun. I'll be talking about uh, making a map from start to finish. This is kind of a neat new, new uh, way of presenting for me. Um, often when I'm looking at the work that somebody has done, I think that is unattainable and it's impossible and I can't do it. And then when I see the process that they take to actually create that, it's Oftentimes it's just a series of very simple things or hacks. And I'm like, I can do that. And then I can do that. And then you can string them together and make you know, your own maps. And it's really, um, I don't wanna say disarming. It's uh, really encouraging. Cause then I think I can do those things too. So that's what I'll do today is I'll just kind of cycle through the process of a map from start to finish. <clears throat> map design for the everyday map. And I'll talk about the choices I'm making as I go, why I'm doing something. Um, this is the map we're going to end up with. So this is the map that we're going to be creating from scratch today. Just as a preview, is this, is this the perfect map? Is this even a very good map? No. It's, you know, it's an okay map. It'll get the job done. Really what this is, is a vessel into which I'm going to pour a bunch of uh, unfounded general claims and opinions and rationalizations. But more specifically, um, you'll catch on to perhaps a few tips and tricks, maybe a dozen or so that I use in the process of making maps. And you'll use these tips and tricks for much more um, noble goals than I will. So some general advice and some tips and tricks for specifics. I'll be using ArcGIS Pro. So here is ArcGIS Pro, and I'm looking at a base map, the, the uh, topographic base map, which is the default base map of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Dallas-Fort Worth, I've been to Dallas-Fort Worth, uh, and I actually fly through Dallas-Fort Worth an awful lot. Not surprised by how much water there is there, actually. This has nothing to do with my presentation, but I'm surprised by how much water there is in and around Dallas, Fort Worth. So here's some data. It's not really important what the data is. Um, just for the sake of that whole me pouring ideas into a vessel kind of thing, we can pretend that this data has something to do with geology or topography or the terrain of a place. You know, maybe it's the um, proportion of um, Dallas, Fort Worth hiking enthusiast magazine subscribers or the um, dissolved uh, uh, calcium in the soil, you know, so something that you actually want to see some geography and terrain in addition to the data too. So some context. And here I am with the trusty old red to yellow to green color scheme. And for better or worse, mostly worse, we're stuck with red, yellow, green forever into infinity. As long as 
we are driving or riding in cars. You know, we're stuck with that whole stoplight metaphor. Stop. Hey, you better think about stopping and then go. Okay. And that makes its way into maps oftentimes. And it's not always the best color scheme. Uh, I'm not going to say don't ever use it, but um, I, I tend to avoid it because it's purely chromatic. It's purely hue driven, red, green, and yellow. And if I actually um, take the saturation slider and just slide it all the way down to grayscale, it looks like this. So we have no tonal variability in our map right now. Our brain, our cognitive wet works is having to run pretty hot trying to differentiate between just hues. And we're not all that great at differentiating between just hues. It's nice to incorporate some amount of light to dark within those hues too, or just go pure monochrome light to dark. So here is a couple of previews of what that might look like to a person who has colorblindness, a couple forms of colorblindness simulated here kind of quickly and clumsily, just to give you a sense that if you're using a red, green, um, yellow color scheme, it might not be the best option for a lot of your readers and it might be inaccessible actually. So there's some um, accessibility compliance issues at work even if you're using a red to yellow to green color scheme. So what do you do, right? Um, well, like I said, you can, you can have a tonal map. This is uh, monochrome. It's just using uh, shades of green from very light green to very dark green. And somebody who I was chatting with who happens to be colorblind and I was asking for advice on what color schemes work, um, a little bit of advice that they gave me, and it's just been amazing. And I've thought of it so many times since is if you in your color range can vary the tone of something from light to dark or dark to light, then it doesn't matter what other colors you use, you're bulletproof. A person with uh, profound colorblindness will still be able to interpret the difference in value from light to dark. Uh, and they used the word bulletproof, which I thought was pretty cool. That's probably why it stuck with me. So here is uh, the boundary of our area of interest, our, our focus area, Dallas-Fort Worth area. And it's just a big, thick uh, black outline, but maybe we can do a little bit better than that. So let's, uh, let's open up um, our geoprocessing tools. I only want to look at focus on Dallas Fort Worth. I don't necessarily need all the data surrounding it. That happens to be ancillary and perhaps even a little bit distracting because I want the people to focus on that area of interest. So I can do a select layer by location and say everything that has its center within this area of interest, select that. And then uh, one of my favorite tools back in the old ArcGIS uh, or ArcMap days was to right click a layer and make a new layer from the selected features. Do you all remember that? It's, I mean, I still use it. Uh, when it made its way into ArcGIS Pro, I like uh, flipped my table and like shouted and ran around the neighborhood. It's here. So you can right click on your layer with selections and say, make layer from selected features and then turn the other one off. I didn't have to delete anything. You know, I didn't have to write a query or anything like that. I've, now I've just got a focused pile of data in the area that I am interested in, the area of interest. Um, unfortunately, though, my base map is completely occluded. It's covered up by this data. And I want to know the names of these roads. I want to get a sense for the terrain. Are there rivers nearby? Are there uh, differences in uh, the, the topography of this area? And I can't see anything. Yeah, it's all, it's all covered up with data. So naturally, what I'll do is just set the transparency of this layer to 50% so I can see through. I can still see my data, and I can still see through to the base, to the base map. It's just not that great. You know, I'm losing so much information. I'm losing half of my tonal variability, honestly, by doing this. And I'm incorporating some per perhaps misinterpretation bias because of the underlying colors might uh, impact this core plef map that has some transparency set on top of it. What can I do? What am I going to do? Well, let's take a look at our options. It doesn't always have to be a core plef map. I, so here is an option for graduated symbols. I can pick graduated symbols. And so, okay, um, now the human eye or the, the human mind isn't so hot at detecting colors in hue alone. It's really good at detecting senses of light and dark, but it's also really good at detecting the change in something's size. And I like, um, I like graduated symbols because it's a, it's a form of natural mapping. So in the, in the UX industry, there's this design 
philosophy called um, natural mapping. And it means the thing, the control mechanism for that thing mimics its shape or appearance in real life. And I'll give you my favorite example, which is when I'm fumbling to reset my seat position in a car, maybe I've rented a car and it's foreign to me, I'm fumbling around for the seat controls. If I reach down and the, the buttons are shaped like my actual car seat, you know, I, I can feel the back and I can move the back forward and backward. I can feel the seat and I can adjust the seat up and I can adjust the seat down. I don't need to look at what I'm using because my fingers can recognize the fact that it's a car seat and I'm literally directing. That's natural mapping. So uh, natural mapping in cartography might mean there's more of something. So there's more of something on the map. It's a natural mapping. It's a way more mainline way of uh, putting data into our brains is natural mapping. But look at this uh, natural breaks categorization that it's got by default. Natural breaks is okay. However, I almost never use it because if I'm going to uh, create a layout and make a legend for this, and uh, I say, hey, everybody, look at, look, at my, look at my breaks. I've got 22 and 37 and 52 and 71. People are gonna be like, really? A, it's a little bit confusing and people are gonna think it's a little bit more complex map than I thought. And so they lose confidence when they experience the map, which you don't wanna lose confidence. But also they might lose a little bit of trust because they're saying, what are you trying to pull on me? having categories like this, you know, who knows, this is a very broad swath of data. And then you've got a narrow chunk of data, what's going on here, and you lose trust. So trust is a very big component of cartography. And so if I change this to equal interval, my map is virtually the same, but I have very nice, convenient, um, easy to understand range breaks here 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, everybody can get that you can imagine those chunks out of 100. And admittedly, I can get away with this because my data is relatively normally distributed. If this were non-normally distributed, I'd have to think of something else. But hey, I locked out and it's normally distributed. So I'm definitely gonna choose equal interval because it's a nice clean legend. And clarity and communication is what a map is all about, right? So if you can access those little bits of clarity throughout the process, go for it. Now, uh, the default, so you're gonna hear me say the word default an awful lot in this presentation. And that's intentional. I don't want you to think that I hate defaults. Defaults are necessary. Everything has to have a default condition if it's to be. Whoa, that was interesting. We should be defaulted on, defaulted on a mute in this case. Defaults are powerful. Uh, whoever is controlling defaults in the software industry is the most powerful person in that software company. I'll tell you that right now. Um, and defaults are necessary, and they're usually a pretty good choice for getting started. But we want to move past just the default and look at every default and think critically about it and think, how can I improve this and uh, apply my own thinking to this design process? So do I want to stick with fasting Pac-Man symbols here? You know, you got a bunch of Pac-Man Symbols, he doesn't want to eat, he's got no mouth, yellow, like a lemon map, I don't know. Uh, so you can change all of these by clicking into this template and digging into this symbol specifically. And where you change it here, it'll have a global effect and change it for all of those categories. And right off the bat, I can say, well, I'm covering, I'm still covering up a lot of my background map, even though I've gone to graduated symbols, I'm losing the context of that underlying. What if I just get rid of the fill? Do I need a fill for that? No, you don't need a fill. So I can just get rid of that lemon yellow fill and see through. And maybe I step up the thickness of the, the outline width a little bit if I want to. That looks not that great. We're getting somewhere though, right? So the map I made that I showed you at the beginning is the result of me trying and hating 8 million other things. This is the process, you know? I'm not in love with this, uh, it looks like a spider's eyes, spider, the chaos of a spider's face or something like that. Also, if you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable right now, there's a phobia uh, whose name I can't really remember, but I can relate to it. Um, somebody pointed out on Twitter when I shared a, a screenshot of this, but I was already aware of how creepy it can be for, uh, semi-regular arrays of circles of varying size. It can freak people out. And I was like, this is kind of an interesting kind. What do you mean it freaks you out? So if you Google that later, not right now, you're not gonna Google that now, of course. If you Google it, you can get a really good under. 
like people can be kind of horrified with these patterns of circles that are semi-regular of different sizes because it in, uh, it looks like a insect's nest or an unhealthy skin condition or something like that. It's really, um, Google image search that later, uh, good times. Okay, so we're looking at this eh, kind of slightly creepy array of circles. Do they have to be black? No, again, the black outline is the default, but we don't need it to be black. Let's make it a big bright color if it's not gonna be black, right? Ah, let's try something a little bit more muted. Uh, I like this. I like where we're headed with this, but we could do a lot better. Um, now again, do I, do I just reach into the cartographer's bag of tricks and then pull out bright dark red circles or dark green circles or something? No, too often we pull into that bag and we pull out color. Um, there are a lot of other visual dimensions. And so let me show you something. So instead of just a, a simple yellow ring, let's dig in to the polygon symbol itself. And I'll click this. I'm kind of diving into this next level. And you can see there that I've got an empty fill and a yellow stroke outline. And if I go to that little wrench there called structure, uh, I can duplicate that yellow outline, make another copy of it, and then add a little effect called move, which will just nudge it over a little bit in whatever direction I want, and then make it black, specifically semi-transparent black, right? A little fake shadow. Now check this out. I can do that a couple more times. Each time I make it a little thicker and the mostly transparentness of it stacks up to give you this um, built up opacity fake shade hack effect. And now when we look at our SpaghettiOs, I didn't need to make them neon green shouting at me. I'm using the simple hack of a drop shadow to give them a, a visual sense of four from the background of the base map. They're popping off of the map a little bit. And they're also more easily differentiated between each other because of that little drop shadow hack. Give that a shot if you're interested. Okay, so let's, let's close this data and take a, a closer look at our base map. This is the default base map. I should tell you, topography is by far light years ahead of all the other base maps um, in terms of usage, customer usage. If we look at our stats, it's uh, 98, you know, I'm making this up, 98% of people are using the topographic base map, then 2% use all of the other base maps combined. Um, that's a made up stat, but it's probably not too far from reality. Why is that? Why is that? It's because the topographic base map is the default base map. And people just don't change it. It's the default. Okay, I'm looking at a map. I'm, I'm, I've got data to think about, not base maps, right? And so we just accept that default without thinking about it. But it's fun to think about base maps and pick a different base map or be crazy and just make our own base map because we're totally insane map makers and we're going to make our own base map. Like it's the pre-base map days in Arc Map. Remember that? No base map. You had to build your own. Uh, how terrifying, but fun, free. Let's try this. So I can change this to imagery. You know, why not use imagery for my for a, a, a backdrop to my data? I literally am showing you what's on the ground. If I'm interested in terrain, if I'm interested in in, in a, the topography of an area, just show literally some satellite imagery of that area and now you're done, right? Is this the best way of going about things? Well, not really because you're showing an awful lot of detail. There's an awful lot happening in these pixels. It's high contrast and still I'm not terribly aware of any kind of uh, high areas or low areas. Does Dallas Fort Worth even have high areas and low areas? Every place does. Every place has a little bit of one and we'll find out in Dallas Fort Worth where the high areas and where the low areas are. So I'm looking at this, all of map making pretty much is making a generalized simplified version of the world. Um, and so let's make a simplified version of this. And I'm gonna add some data here, right click the map layer and say add data. It'll open up the trusty old add data dialog, but there's an option there called living Atlas, a little tab there on the left. If I choose living Atlas, living Atlas is a, like a, a Wikipedia-like repository that Esri makes available for you to put your data in to share publicly or for big organizations, you know, federal, local agencies to put their data in the, as a place where they can access it for their customers or just make it available globally. 
I mean, it's where Esri puts Esri's data that we want you to use, you know, have at it. So Living Atlas is a, a really uh, bountiful treasure trove of unspeakable pleasures. So let's click on Living Atlas. And there's a lot there. So I'll do a search for Hillshade and I'll choose Terrain Hillshade. Terrain Hillshade is an image service. That means it's gonna say, hey, hey, uh, server a million miles away. It's gonna go to space, it's gonna bounce off space, come back to some uh, server and say, give me uh, an image service of Hillshade at this extent. And it'll be a set of pixels, not tiles. It looks like this. It's like a Hillshade, it's okay. Okay, yes, you got me. There's not a ton topographically happening in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but there's some stuff happening. We can see it. We can see where there's little bits of ridges and maybe a little bit of river valleys. Ah, uh, I don't know. Um, what do I do with this? I just lost all the context of my imagery. Is it topography? Is it hillshade or is it imagery? Well, back in the old days, we might just push the transparency of this hillshade wholesale down, but then you get this kind of diluted, washed out, map that kind of looks all gray and not that fun. So with the Hillshade layer selected, I'm going to go up into the Appearance tab. And there's this uh, just beautiful set of options called Layer Blend, Blend Modes. Blend Modes are available in ArcGIS Pro. If you have a graphic designer friend or if you've um, done any work in Illustrator or uh, Photoshop, you'll know that Blend Modes are like just the revving beast engine inside those graphical tool sets. You can do anything with blend modes. Blend modes, don't be intimidated by them. It's just rules that the program takes for how to show something. Technically, the fact that I've got terrain hillshade on top of imagery, and that's what shows up is a blend mode, like Z layer, this you know concept of the Z layer that humans made up is a blend mode. Now I'm showing what's on top. Uh, transparency is a blend mode. Um, but what this is, is just kind of breaking that seal open and saying, here's a bunch of other awesome blend modes too. And we'll try something called luminosity. Luminosity, this is pretty interesting. So what luminosity does is it takes the um, uh, bright and dark texture of that hill shade, and it pulls in the color of the underlying imagery. So really we're just, we're colorizing like people do with old black and white films. We're colorizing the hill shade with the hues of the underlying imagery. It's kind of interesting. So we're, we're blending them in that manner. Uh, it's not quite enough though. I'm looking at this. I think we could do a little bit more. So I'm gonna go back into Living Atlas and now I'm gonna search for something called terrain. And there it is, terrain. Terrain is just a digital elevation model service that covers the whole world. You zoom out to the whole world, it'll show you the DEM for the whole world. You zoom in to Dallas-Fort Worth, it'll show you the DEM for Dallas-Fort Worth. That's great, it's super convenient. You don't have to worry about finding your own elevation models and worrying about scale. It's all there for you in this image service. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't this a beautiful image service? <laughs> I like clean minimalist maps enough, just like anybody else, but holy smokes, what are we even looking at here? Like a dark, what have you done, Nelson? You've ruined your map. Okay, well, uh, the way elevation models work is low areas are black and high areas are white. And the Mariana Trench is really deep and the tip of Everest is really high. What's Dallas-Fort Worth got to say about that? It's the very middle of that unknowably vast sandwich, right? Dallas-Fort Worth sandwich. Um, you aren't stuck with it, right? You can, you can inform it and say, hey, don't color scale the whole thing based on this global data, based on the whole world. Make it dynamic. Say, where's the lowest area in my map view and the highest area in my map view and set those to black and white. Now all of a sudden I can see some elevation, right? This is a digital elevation model that I can start making some sense of. And naturally what I'm gonna do is open the appearance tab, check out the blend modes. And in this case, I'm gonna use a blend mode called soft light. Soft light will take the lightness and the darkness and it will multiply it based on everything that's underneath it. If um, my terrain is white, it'll boost the brightness. If my terrain is dark, if my elevation is dark, it'll uh, boost the darkness. It's kind of like a contrast builder that uh, bakes the color and the contrast together. And it looks like this. There's really, I think we're getting something a little bit charming, uh, almost a little bit wonderful. I, I think it's really interesting. Now um, we're using the highest to the lowest point as uh, white to black, but you aren't stuck with that 
um, absolute discrete range uh, of minimum and maximum, I can do something called percent clip. And what that does is it looks at the histogram of elevation pixels in my view, and it just chops off however much of the tails. It gets rid of some of the outliers. Maybe I've got this weird, crazy peak or this deep valley. And what the, this will result in is a higher contrast image, which looks like this, a little bit more visually interesting. I pushed some more meaning out of this day. You can actually see the dammed up reservoirs. Isn't that kind of kind of cool? I can see the, the dams there in the, in the northern part of the, the city areas and you can see that feature where it abruptly splits it and then the river downstream i think that's fun i love that kind of stuff sorry i'm a nerd but you guys are too you're my fellow nerds and i'm in a good place i'm safe with you fellow nerds okay but i have no context so i'm looking at this kind of green and brown uh bumpy swoopy terrain that's cool now i have a concept for uppy downiness but I don't have a concept for like the political features or the roadways, that kind of stuff. So I'm going to open once again, the add data dialogue. I'm going to choose living Atlas and living Atlas has every base map that Esri has made available to you here and every component of every base map. And I like a base map called human geography, but I mainly like it because I like to steal the labels and the road and political boundaries from it. And I don't use the background because this is a multi-part base map. So I just steal the reference stuff. And I'll steal the label and the detail. And it looks like this. Now we're working on kind of an interesting base map. It's a little bit shouty though. I'm looking at those, um, looking at those labels. They're black labels with a white border around each one of them. And my base map is relatively light and they kind of buzz and it's a little bit hard to read. I don't need that double stroke that I would um, otherwise. And so what I'm gonna do is highlight human geography label, once again, go to the blend modes and choose multiply. Multiply will only darken based on your input. So it's gonna take a look at my labels and multiply it by the value of white to black. If it's white, it's not gonna add any information. If it's black, it's gonna multiply that. And so what I get is I'm essentially erasing all the white content from that layer just by using that blend mode. I didn't have to go in and rebuild vector tile layer, restyle it, make my own copy, all that overhead, forget it. I can just use a blend mode and keep the darkness of that. Now, conversely, the, the road network is a little bit much for me. And so I wanna tone that down. I could just use the transparency slider and mute it a little bit, but I actually wanna do a better job and bake that into my background. So with that one selected, I'll choose the soft light, which uh, we've seen before. It'll take the lights and the darks and just multiply that to the background value. And if I choose this, then it kind of bakes it in. I've brightened my roads and I've darkened in the, uh, the gutters around the roads. And I can visually have that sense of context for my base map, but um, it's not just banging me over the head with all that base map information. It's commensurate with how important it is, which is, you know, it's just there for context. How do you like my water layer? I'm done. Let's call it a, call it a map. We're done. We're good. Default purple. Um, no, of course not. Um, so if I open this up, I'm going to change it to something that's more watery. You know what I mean? I'm not going to choose straight up blue, easy hex blue, RGB blue. I'm going to use something kind of muted, desaturated. My, I had a cartography teacher who told me one time, whatever color you're thinking of using, take the uh, saturation slider and push it almost all the way to the end and then push it some more. And I thought that was pretty interesting advice. So anyways, here's a pretty desaturated light, bluish periwinkly water uh, color. And we've got that default gray stroke in there. Now the gray outline is rendering on top of and in the middle of the boundary for those uh, water bodies. It doesn't have to be that way. If I go to the structure, I can click that boundary and drag it underneath my fill, which is pretty interesting. And then I'll add an effect called move, just like I did for those fake drop shadows for my uh, graduated uh, yellow graduated symbol rings. So I'm gonna drag that below my fill. I'm gonna give it a move setting, and then I'm just gonna duplicate that. So now I have two versions of an outline that's got a move effect. And then back in my, um, my layers tab here, I can make the one on the bottom right area kind of look like a, sunlit beach, like all the beaches do, or, you know, the famous beaches of Dallas, Fort Worth. So we've got kind of this tan coastal co color 
of these water bodies, but it's only rendering on the bottom right side of the polygons, the water polygons. That's fun. But what's even more fun is if you take a look at the opposite shore and we'll make that kind of this dark blue, like the vegetation is kind of shading this area. Uh, and I've moved it up to the top left. So now I've got uh, lake polygons that actually look slightly chiseled in, kind of embossed into the landscape and a vaguely more realistic presentation of those things. All right, done with water. Let's take a look at that area of interest line. Oh my goodness. So what is this like a four point black stroke? That's my area of interest people. Now, ironically, somebody could look at this and wonder like, what data is this? Is this like a, a, a freeway roundabout or something? like, what am I, uh, the quarantine zone for the movie arrival? Nobody in, nobody out. We're all going to, um, it can be confused with actual data instead of just being a visual tool that we're using to help draw the eye to our area of interest. So let's make this more of a visually pushed back, pleasant um, presentation. I'm gonna make this a gradient stroke instead of a solid stroke. And I'm gonna give it an offset of half of its width so that it renders fully outside of its self of its polygon. So now I'm seeing white to black outside of the polygon. Maybe you can see where I'm going with this. And the next step, instead of black to white, I'm gonna open those color scheme properties and we're gonna make the outside kind of lighter green. I'm gonna make the inside color a darker green. And then I'm gonna make that outside fully transparent and that inside, I'm gonna push back that opacity a little bit. So now I have something that looks a little bit like, you know, kind of a nice little pleasant little cute, adorable little drop shadow effect around my area of interest. It's not shouting at me with a big four point uh, black outline that I might think is data. Now it's more visually appropriate for its purpose, just to, to say, hey, Nelson, Dallas-Fort Worth is the topic of this map, in case you wouldn't, didn't know, and you, in case you didn't know where that ended. But uh, we can do a little bit better of a job. So we're only halfway there. I'm going to, once again, open trusty old add data. I'm going to click on Living Atlas, and I'm going to search for what is easily my favorite layer in Living Atlas. And you could quote me on this. Global background. Global background is exactly what it sounds like. It's a giant rectangle that covers the whole world. That's it. That's all it is. A rectangle covers the whole world. I'm going to add this. And it looks a lot like you may have imagined it was going to look like. It's a giant rectangle that covers the whole world. But what it is, uh, is an input for geoprocessing tools. This happens to me all the time. Almost every map that I make has at least one instance of global background pulled into it so I can cookie cutter something out of it. Speaking of cookie cutters, let's open the erase geoprocessing tool. And I'll say, hey, I want to erase the Dallas-Fort Worth area from my global background polygon, which looks like this. Now, it can be impossible to mistake where my area of interest is. Boom, Dallas-Fort Worth. This is what I'm looking at. Um, is it good looking? No, but we're not done yet. Now I've made it white. Now it's done. No, I'm just kidding. This could be an island for all I know at this point, right? If I didn't know anything about Dallas-Fort Worth, I might think, you know, is this an island? What's going on here? What's around it? I want a little bit of context. So instead of just being solid white, I'm going to once again visit my good old friends, the blend modes, and I'm going to use soft light again. If you haven't picked up um, this by now, soft light, I think, is my favorite blend mode because it's the most variable. If you've got light content, it'll boost the brightness. If you've got dark content, it'll boost its darkness. And it's just super handy and flexible. And there we go. So now I've uh, blend moded my area, my not Dallas Fort Worth polygon. So I can still see, I have the benefit of context, but visually it's been reduced and I can have that context around it. But my eye is pleasantly drawn as all eyes are always to Dallas Fort Worth. Now I'm gonna drag that water polygon down under my uh, base map label because it's driving me insane that those lakes cover up some of the labels. Like look at rock wall over there getting covered up by my lake. So I'm gonna drag that down. Hey, I just recently learned in Ali's in rock wall. Rock wall is named after what people thought might be a natural uh, or uh, an artificial ancient stone wall that was uncovered in some unbelievably 
uh, weird manner. They're like, this is like a many thousands of year old, but I think uh, it turns out they think it's actually a natural feature, but it sure looks a lot like a rock wall. Google that later too, after you're done with your phobia Googling. Gross circle phobia is probably a good way to Google the other phobia thing. So, okay, now rock wall has popped up on top of the lake. It's not been submerged. Um, moving on, I think we're ready to create a layout. So I'm working on my map and now it's time to make a layout. You know, this is the goal of the whole thing is to make a layout. Um, uh, in the insert menu, I've chosen a new layout and I'm gonna choose a custom page size, of course because none of those amazing options are good enough for me. I know that I want this to live on a typical computer monitor, which in my case is 1920 by 1080. Um, but that aspect ratio holds up a lot of the time. If you're using like these iMac people that I'm jealous of that have the monitors that are like a drive-in movie, it's the same aspect ratio. So you'll get away with this aspect ratio. It's the dimensions of my monitor in this case. So there it is, a little mini version of my monitor saying, hey, John, what are you gonna put on me? and I'm going to insert my map. So I'll choose the insert tab, I'll expand the map frame, I'll click on my wonderful map of Dallas-Fort Worth, and there it is, kind of far away, and very small, lonely, sitting there in the uh, plains of mid-north Texas. I, I don't know, there's probably a better term. Um, I'm sure there is. I'm going to rename this because I'm fastidious and I'm going to have to keep track of things because things are going to get pretty busy in this layout in a little bit. And I'll call this main map and I'll dig into its properties. And in its properties, by default, I've got a one pixel black border surrounding my map frame. And I am definitely going to ch uh, change that to zero point border because I don't need a one pixel black border around everything, right? If I needed one, that's cool. It's a really reasonable default. It's, is it the best default? Probably. Uh, but again, take a look at defaults and change what uh, you decide needs to happen. I'm going to get rid of that outline. Too many outlines and too many maps, folks. Um, and now I'm going to activate it. I'm going to right-click the map frame and activate it. What this does is kind of punches a navigation interface in so I can kind of zoom in and center and position Dallas-Fort Worth how I like. And then I hit close. And now I've got a nice view of Dallas-Fort Worth. And I'm gonna turn on my data. Remember this, remember my data layer where we all, I feel like I've been through so much with you all. And uh, gosh, remember talking about graduated circles? Okay, there they are. And I'm gonna copy this map. If I look at this layout, um, I'm making the best use I've got. I mean, like, look at the shape of Dallas-Fort Worth. It's this tall, but it's only, it's kind of roundish. Got all this wasted space on the end. Um, at the same, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's okay to have empty space as long as it's balanced. But I also have a comparatively densely packed um, set of graduated symbols along the center and that depression area from the north through downtown Dallas. See how it's denser, dense, densely packed there? I wanna have uh, an inset map that shows that it'll, with a little bit more resolution. No problem. Do I have to start over and make a new map? No, check this out. I'm just gonna copy this map and right click my layout and hit paste. And it'll add another version of my map, which I can very easily just resize to however I want it, wherever I want it to live in that layout. And now I have an, an inset map, but uh, what's the point of my inset map if I haven't zoomed in or changed anything about it, right? Also the area that I'm interested in has a, a pretty, reasonable angle. And if I zoom in, I'm going to lose a lot of the data at the at the corners. I want to rotate that inset map to line up with the space that I have available because I'm pragmatic. And if I, uh, well, first I'm going to right click my main map and I'm going to move it over so it's not getting clipped off. Now I'm going to right click my inset map, dig into the properties and there's a rotate feature, isn't that cool? Check out those tabs, what's in there. Uh, for the longest time, I just ignored those things, but there's so much magic in there, so much fun. Too much fun? Yeah, probably. But maybe you work by the hour. Go ahead, have some fun. And I'm gonna uh, set a rotation angle of negative 40. And now I've got a more aligned set of data for my inset map. I'm gonna activate this. I'm gonna zoom in so it fits. And I've got a main map and I've got an inset map showing me a little bit more detailed view of my 
beautiful friends in Dallas, Fort Worth. Now, it's got no outline. Remember when I deleted the outline? Well, I still have no outline around it, but I, now I kind of need one, right? Shame on me, Nelson, getting rid of all my outlines. Now I'm going to add one back. Well, that's okay. That's why it's nice to have a default outline there that you can tell that you have the choice of having an outline. So if I right click and choose the properties for this map view, I can click on this border symbol and dig into it a little bit more. I don't have to just click on a color or a thickness. I can click this and dig into more options, which I definitely suggest you do. And true, true to character, my nature is to change things to gradient strokes. I'm going to change this to a gradient stroke too. No surprise there. And it's black to white. Um, I'm going to make it black to semi or to fully transparent black, not fully transparent white, or else you get all kinds of gray tones in between black to transparent black. Okay. And then I'm going to fade back. So it's semi transparent black to fully transparent black, just to make it a little more subtle. You know, we don't need it to shout a shadow at us, just kind of a cute little shadow that says, Hey, you know, I'm a little shadow. And right now we've got a six point fat stroke around this and half of it is covering up the other side of the map. So what I'm going to do is expand the offset effect and give it a negative offset. So it snugs it in to only render inside that map view. And now I've got a main map and an inset map. And that inset map has an inner shadow that helps it visually recede a little bit from you. So the main map is coming towards me, you know, optical illusion wise. And my inset map is kind of pushed away a little bit. And that's just the way that I want it. That makes sense to me. That's okay. And now I'm going to insert a rectangle. Why am I inserting a rectangle? Well, look at all that area up in the top left. Um, I've got to have a title and a legend for something like this, right? And another thing I learned in, in college, which was 65 years ago, I learned when you're creating a layout, try to achieve balance and pretend that your map is a plate of food. You know, you're going through the potluck. We call them potlucks in the Midwest, I assume. You, uh, you go to a barbecue joint, you go into a barbecue joint, and you've got a plate and you've got to balance it. You know, you got the thing over here and the mashed potatoes over here and the coleslaw on this side. Your plate can't tip. That's the same way for achieving a balanced layout. Just make sure everything is visually balanced so your plate doesn't tip over and you lose the barbecue. So I'm going to draw a big rectangle over here where my nice little house for my title and my legend live. So happy little place for those things to live. And by default, it's a black, good old one pixel black border by default. That's okay. You aren't stuck with it. I'm going to actually uncheck that black border and choose a gradient fill. The default gradient fill is buffered with discrete steps. Um, but instead of buffered with discrete steps, I'm going to choose linear with continuous smooth transition. And instead of that semi-transparent black to white with all those mute muddy gray tones in the middle, I'm gonna switch that around and make it white to transparent white. Now we've got something kind of nice and glassy. It fades off to nothing. Um, now I wanna rotate it so that it's only kind of painting in from the corner. I don't know if you can see my picture right now. I'm doing a lot of hand gesturing and a lot more than I thought I would. This corner, I want it to kind of be like a little sun fade, um, kind of kind of place for my for my happy title and legend to live. And you know, I can expand this drop list and really fine tune this and push push those color handles here and there until I get something where I can't see like an abrupt edge. It just looks. If you didn't know, I added. Uh, if you didn't watch me just add this rectangle, you wouldn't necessarily think that there's a big faded thing there. It's just pushing back the content behind this area to um, allow uh, room. So it affords me a safe place to have a title and a legend, safe places. And, you know, if I'm looking at this map, did you all notice my default? How many of you love the default base map credits that appear in your layout? Do you guys love those? I love them. I just can't get enough of them. Everybody needs to get credit. That's cool. But by golly, they could look a lot better. And the fact that the same content is repeated twice drives me insane. I've got black text with a white stroke again. It's buzzy, but that's okay. That's the default because they don't know if I'm looking at a dark base map or a light base map. They've got to make it work in both cases. Eh. Um, but check this out. When I learned this, it just blew my mind. If you're in a layout, <clears throat> go to the insert tab and choose dynamic text. 
scroll almost all the way down to the bottom. It's hidden because nobody wants you to know about this and choose service layer credits, service layer credits. Then you can click on the map anywhere and it turns it into something interactive and you can, well, you could drag it off screen outside of your layout, but you're not a monster. Give credit where credit is due. Um, you can you can resize it, give it a muted color that's commensurate with how important this is. This is the equivalent of the fast talking guy at the end of a radio ad, right? So put it down there and make it kind of small. Legally, you're good. You know, it's still there. Muted gray doesn't have to be two stroked black and white text. So much better. And there's only one of them. If you remember nothing, remember that trick for uh, being able to edit your service layer credits. I'll show you again. It's up. It's up in the dynamic text area. Service layer credits. Okay. Good. Now I have no context. I'm looking at Dallas Fort Worth. Where the deuce is Dallas Fort Worth? Uh, it's in Texas, I guess. Well, I'm going to insert a new map. And in this map, it's just going to be really simple. Um, I'll choose my uh, shape of Texas and I'll use, I'll copy in my area of interest once more and I'll give them a couple pretty muted colors. I actually used the, uh, the new eyedropper tool, uh, which is awesome. And I just found some light part of the base map and I clicked that for the background of Texas and clicked a dark green area for the area of interest here. And I named it reference and I gave it a, a not web mercator projection. And now back in my layout, I can insert this, insert a map frame, boom, there it is with its beautiful one pixel black border around it. Of course, I'm going to get rid of that story of my life. Um, are we done? No. Well, if you hand this in, well, first of all, you don't have a title or a legend, but your manager is going to say, where's the North Arrow? I need to see a North Arrow where this doesn't qualify as a map. You get an F. Uh, okay. Well, I would push back on that under normal conditions because if your map is uh, North as up and you're dealing with an audience who's familiar with the area, I would say a North Arrow is optional. But in this case, I've actually rotated my inset map and I kind of want to show the fact that that's rotated. I want to be honest. So I'll, I'll add a map. And if I only add one to the inset map, they might think that my main map is rotated too. So, okay, I'm stuck with two North Arrows now. Nelson, you screwed yourself over. Now you got to do two North Arrows. That's all right. So uh, again, this is a vessel into which I'm going to pour little tips and tricks. Uh, I'm going to insert a North Arrow, I'll pick one of the most basic ones because it's not all about north arrows it's about your map and the north arrow is just saying hey this is north big deal so i'll pick north arrow i'll drop it here on my map and by default it's black which when i look at this map all it does is shout at me and says hey i'm the north arrow and i'm black how do you like me now i'm this black north arrow in the corner that's all you're going to look at and uh, you aren't stuck with that color scheme you can open the properties for this and instead of the default black, which is a fine default, I can make it semi-transparent white. No problem. Can you guys hear the sirens right now? It's like there's a... Anybody hear that? Seven alarm fire going on next door to me. We, we muscle through. We muscle through. Okay. So semi-transparent white. And again, just like that trick I did before where I've got something and then I make a copy of it and I move it a little bit. You do the same thing with that little wrench. I just duplicated my North Arrow graphic dragged it below and now I'm making it uh, semi-transparent black and the little position doodad down there, I just nudged it over two pixels in each direction. So now it's this kind of false drop shadow, which looks like that when I add both of them to my maps. A little bit better, a little bit better than just uh, the default black North arrow that uh, draws too much visual attention to, the, to itself. Now it's time for the legend. Oh my goodness. Um, there's so many options with inserting a legend into an ArcGIS Pro lay layout. No one can know the end of the options. It's so bountiful. Uh, and that's cool. If uh, I'm not terribly familiar with all of those options just because I actually, um, I rarely use them, even though you should use them and they're powerful and great tools. So I'm going to insert a legend and I'm going to, uh, with my data layer selected, just click on the map and it'll drop uh, a legend in there and by golly if it didn't put a one pixel black border around it um, and it's got the title of my layer and it's got the attribute by which i'm um, visualizing it and it's got zero to 20 with six 
degrees of precision, six decimal places of precision. Oh my goodness. Um, I think we can uh, simplify this. And I'm gonna simplify it manually. I'm gonna right click and choose convert to graphics. And now this thing is just a set of graphics. I can delete things and edit things as I see fit and rearrange them. So I immediately got rid of that border and I got rid of the two titles because the title of my map is gonna be the title of this legend. And I don't have the word legend in here because it's a legend. And I'm also gonna reduce the complexity. I don't need six decimal degrees of precision. I don't need uh, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60. Everybody gets what's going on. I can just say 20, 40, 60, 80. And when I look at this, I actually wanna invert this because bigger things should stack up on top in my opinion or left to right if you're in um, an English-based left to right reading culture. So here it is. And I think that's more intuitive alignment of this very simple legend, which, um, and then next uh, I'm gonna add, add some, you know, some, you gotta add some text in there. Normally there's a little bit of text that you're forced to add in there. If nothing else, sign your work, put your name on it. My mom always told me when I drew a picture, put your name on it, sign your work. Um, two reasons for that. Uh, the first reason is you did some good work. Go ahead and sign it. That's all right. Take credit for that. Good job, you. Put your name on it. Second is you're going to do a lot better job if you have your name on it, right? If you sign your work, I guarantee you, you're going to be a little bit more careful and thoughtful about the design process and the caliber of your work will be improved as a result. So always sign your work. All that's left now is to export this sucker, finish map.jpg, and it's out the door. We're done. We did that. Now, I want to thank you for whiling away 55 minutes of your allotted time on this earth with me. We covered 148 slides. Who can say they've ever covered 148 slides in 56 minutes? No, this is a new record. Um, I want you to look at my YouTube channel. So I do all kinds of how-to and instructional videos showing you little hacks. A lot of them are one minute map hacks. A minute, come on. Who, who doesn't have a minute? Uh, and then some of them are a little bit longer form demo tutorial kind of thing. So check that out if you would. Uh, it would be my honor if you did that. Thank you very much for hearing me out. Okay, well, thanks, John. A fantastic presentation. Um, and uh, we're running a little bit uh, uh, long, uh, but it was great. And, and uh, so we're going to try to squeeze in a few questions here. If you do have any questions, we'll get them to John and we'll We'll push them up on our, our website. Um, first things first is I want to make sure before everybody jumps off here, I think we had a record today. Uh, Ali, uh, I think I saw 326. Is that somewhere in that ballpark? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to invite everybody tomorrow. Come to our Mappy Hour. We've got two great presenters uh, coming in tomorrow. Um, let's see here. It's a virtual Mappy Hour. Feel free to join us. We got Liz Parrish and we got Tim Nolan, and uh, it should be a lot of fun. It's a disc personality test. So let's go ahead, Ali. Uh, we got some questions and we got people bantering, and, and it's all been good. So let's yeah. kind of scroll through them. Yeah. Um, so one of the first questions I was able to find is Are the waters of the US in the Living Atlas? Not all of them. You have to look around. The one I used is just a layer I had locally that I have a high resolution layer water, uh, water layer for that for that area. A lot of what we do is just Google around looking for good. I Google the word shape file and then what I'm looking for and I cross my fingers. I believe you can pull in the water bodies from the NHD uh, layer as well. So, but yeah, Brian's all right. the Texas water guy, Brian, you, you probably have all these things. Yeah. That's that's what we do is water. Um, guess what is it? Only one natural lake in Texas. So it's Caddo Lake. All right. So everybody's thanking you, John. Uh, great presentation. We got two minutes here. Ali, do you see any more questions? I'm yep. scrolling through myself. Yeah, there's a couple more here. Um, when you select a layer from the table of contents and apply blend mode, is it only blending with the layers below it in the table of contents? Correct. Okay. Yes. All right, and the next one, um, could you make some contours in the DFW area from this DEM, or would that be inappropriate since the Living Atlas terrain layer is a DTM? Ooh, uh, interesting. 
I don't see why it would be wrong if you wanted contours to generate contours from the the uh, elevation input, the DEM input. There's uh, a few different tools you could use to do that. Okay. All right. A question that I've also asked, should blue only be used for water? Nah. <laughs> Use it for whatever you like. I'm trying to find some more in here. Oh, should it only be like if you're using blue, it darn well better be for water. I was saying water can be any color, but usually it should be blue. <laughs> but man, I use blue all over the place for not water stuff. <laughs> so what's your favorite color, John? <laughs> My favorite color is blue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got a lot of comments. People are definitely getting a lot of uh good tricks out of here changing people's lives every day including mine so <laughs> hey everybody spread the word this will be posted on our Eurasia texas youtube channel uh, as soon as we can get around to it and uh, probably which... sorry. Uh, uh this question is popping up multiple times what font did you use for the title uh this happens to be called avenir esri has a license to it and i like it so i use avenir it's a lot like futura mac users would have futura um, yeah, nice, crisp, simple font. Okay. Well, we are right at one o'clock. Um, John, uh, once again, thanks for, uh, the presentation. It was uh, fantastic. Uh, we'll definitely have to bring you back for a part three at some point, uh, maybe not wait as long as 2019 to bring you back but uh, it's been really good we'll have this on our youtube channel i want to thank my co-host and colleague uh, ollie powers for for uh, uh helping putting this on today uh, we will be here next month uh, check out our Eurisa texas uh, web page and um uh, by all means come to our mappy hour tomorrow uh, if you're in germany or greece or wherever uh please attend uh, we'd love to have you everybody's welcome and uh, I guess on that note, we will just go ahead and say goodbye, and we appreciate it. Uh, today was a record in attendance for the, uh, the, the speaker series for years of Texas. So thank you all. We appreciate it. Thanks, thank everybody. Thank you for the invitation. And thank Thanks you, John. Everybody. That was a fantastic presentation. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, everybody, for coming. All thank right. Hope, hope to see you all tomorrow night, or if not, we'll see you next month. Goodbye. <laughs> Take care, everybody.